Hi, welcome to our March Diabetes Support Group meeting. We'll first start with a recap from our February meeting, where our speaker Cassie Shields spoke about um, knowing diabetes by heart. We discussed um, how diabetes can put individuals at an increased risk um, for heart disease, things uh, such as stents, um, heart attacks. You can read all of those statistics there and kind of why managing diabetes is so important. So there's certain risk factors for this. So a large waistline, high triglycerides, uh, low good cholesterol, high blood pressure, high blood glucose, and also smoking. We discussed that there are ways to reduce the risk of these. So knowing your A, B, C, D, E, and S. So A is the A1C, monitoring that and knowing what it means. B is blood pressure, so managing that, whether that be through medications or exercise. We discussed cholesterol, um, how eating healthy, but also there's medications to help manage that as well. We discussed diet, um, and that's something Alex will be speaking on today. We discussed exercise. And then lastly, we discussed the importance of stopping smoking. If you have any questions about this presentation, it's posted on the SRHC Facebook page, and we encourage you to go back and watch that. And with that, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Alex Xander Aliling. Um, he's a resident here at Salina Regional Health Center, and we're excited for his presentation. Hi everyone, so my name is Alex and I'm excited to talk about nutrition planning and meal considerations with diabetes tonight. So before we get into the nitty grit of our presentation, I just want to talk about the importance of nutrition while having diabetes. So having a healthy meal plan, it's important for us to keep it within our uh, target blood sugar range when we have diabetes. Um, alongside with balanced eating and a healthy exercise, there are many benefits to eating well such as helps with weight loss if we're overweight. Um, it allows us to have, feel good and have more energy. This will help us increase our quality of life and just overall our outlook as well. And most importantly, it can prevent or delay diabetes-related complications, such as eye damage or kidney disease. So some general principles of foods that we should eat with diabetes. First off, um, can't forget our vegetables. And our vegetables, they're divided up into two different categories. So we have our non-starchy and our starchy vegetables. Our non-starchy vegetables, those are kind of like our cabbages, carrots, eggplant, lettuce, tomatoes, peppers. While our starchy vegetables, those are more like our potatoes, peas, and corn. We can also have fruits, such as apples, bananas, and oranges. Those have a lot of minerals and vitamins, so that's important that we get enough of those. We should also have grains as well. And particularly with grains, we want to make sure that Half of our grain intake are from whole grains. So when we think about whole grains versus refined grains, refined grains are things like white rice, white pasta, and also white bread as well. So those are things that we want to limit, and in terms of grains, we want to increase the whole grains, such as like brown rice or whole wheat bread. Um, we also want to have enough protein intake for our muscle building as well. And specifically, we want to have lean meats over red meat. So examples of lean meat would be chicken breast, and also egg whites. And for dairy, such as milk and yogurt, as much as possible, you want to make sure that we have uh, ones that are non-fat or low-fat dairy products. And now kind of on the flip side, uh, let's talk about foods and drinks that we should limit. Um, our first one are fried foods and other foods high in saturated and trans fats. So fried foods and those kinds of other foods they increase our cholesterol, can increase weight gain as well, which can further complicate diabetes, which is why we want to make sure that we limit the intake of those foods. Foods high in sodium can also increase our blood pressure, and those can lead to other cardiovascular complications as well. Um, sweets such as baked goods, candy, and ice cream, we all know that these kinds of food products, they have a lot of sugar in them, so when we do have too much of them, they will, they will spike our blood pressure, uh, our blood sugar rather, which will kind of make it uh, out of range for our goal. And similarly, we also want to avoid 
sorry, to limit beverages with added sugar, such as regular soda, uh, regular sports drinks, or energy drinks, and especially fruit juices as well. There's a lot of added sugars in like orange juice, apple juice, and cranberry juice. So now let's talk about meal planning with diabetes. Um, having a direct uh, plan with your meals is an effective way of controlling our blood sugars. So what exactly is meal planning? And so it's pretty simple, so it's just basically planning our meals, and there's different components to what we consider as meal planning. So one is, it's a guide of when, what, and how we should be eating our foods. Uh, depending on the time of day and how much carbs we should be taking, those are all considered in our meal plan. Making sure that our meal plan, it keeps our blood sugars within range. So making sure that we're not having too much carbs, we're not having too much fats, and not too much sugar as well. And it also accounts for our goals, tastes, lifestyles, and also the medications we take. So for goals, if our goal is to lose body fat, to lose weight, we want to make sure our meal plan incorporates some sort of calorie deficit where we're able to lose weight on a particular meal plan. In terms of taste, it caters to what foods we, not only that we should eat, but foods that we also like so we can stick to that plan as well. Lifestyle, if we're very active and we're always uh, exercising, we may have a meal plan that has maybe a little bit more calories compared to someone that isn't as active. And with medications we take, particularly with our type 1 uh, diabetic patients that have to use insulin, they also have to consider when they should be eating their snacks and their meals as well. And there are different ways that we can implement uh, planning our meals, and tonight we'll talk about carb counting and the plate method. So for carb counting, it's essentially what it sounds like. We're keeping track of our carbs from what we drink, what we eat in our meals, and also our snacks as well. Many people with diabetes, they implement this uh, form of carb counting because it does make it easier for us to control our blood sugar levels. And really the benefit of having carb counting is that we all have a, we stay healthy longer, uh, we feel better and improves quality of life. And like we said at the beginning of the presentation is that um, it'll be able to prevent or delay any diabetes related complications. So um, now that we're counting our carbs, how, many car uh, how much carbs should we eat? Um, the one thing to stress out is to know that no one size fits all. So your carb requirement is going to be different from uh, person to person. And this really all depends on how old we are, how much we weigh, and also activity factors. So a patient that's younger and that's extremely active, they may have a higher carb requirement compared to someone that's maybe older and not as active. For a general rule of thumb of counting our carbohydrates is that half of our daily calorie intake should come from carbs. And also to remember is that for about every four calories of carbs, that's about one gram of carbohydrates. So something to keep on mind when we go to the next slide. So for example, if we have someone that takes in about 1,800 calories in one day, so if we split that about half, that'll be about 800 to 900 calories of carbohydrates they should consume. And then when we translate that to grams of carbs, that would be about 200 to 225 grams of carbs daily. And one thing to remember is that we want to make sure that we don't eat all of our carbohydrates in one particular meal. And this is because if we do that, we can end up spiking our blood sugars, which will throw it out of range. So uh, what's recommended by the ADA is that for women, uh, about 45 grams of carbs per meal and for men, about 55 grams of carbs per meal. And then considering our uh, snack intake, it should be about 15 to 30 grams of carbs, depending on our activity level or how we're feeling that particular day in terms of uh, calorie intake. Now we'll talk about the plate method. So if we consider the plate method, it's we're looking at a standard nine inch dinner plate. And what we're doing is we're just dividing up that plate into sections that are more uh, diabetic friendly. So if we look at the plate on the screen, about half of that is gonna be filled with our non-starchy vegetables, uh, such as peppers, uh, lettuce, and carrots. On one fourth of that plate, it's gonna be our lean protein, like our chicken breasts and our egg whites. And then the last fourth of that plate is gonna be our grains or our starchy foods, such as rice, bread, or potatoes. Um, so when we're planning our meals, if we're kind of on the fly or on the go, 
Um, we like to use this little tidbit of kind of looking at our hands to measure the amount of food that we should be taking in. So if we kind of consider the palm of our hand, that's about three ounces of fish, meat, or poultry. Um, if we look at our, the length of our thumb, that's about one ounce of meat or cheese. Um, if we look at a fist, that's approximately about one cup or one medium fruit. And then if we look at our, the palm of our hand like this, that's about one to two ounces of nuts or pretzels. Um, and then about the length of our thumb tip, that's about one tablespoon. And then about one teaspoon is going to be the tip of our finger. So we can use these as a rough estimate when we're preparing our meals, or especially if we're having snacks, so we kind of judge how much carbs and calories we're taking in. So now that we know why we should be preparing our meals ahead of time and how to prepare them, uh, let's talk about grocery shopping when we're kind of finding the ingredients for our meals. So one tip we would like to mention is that you want to make sure that you plan out your week's uh, meals before you go to grocery shopping. And we do this because it'll help you keep focused on what you should buy. It'll help avoid waste and especially also cost as well. Uh, make sure that you do not want to shop hungry. When you shop hungry, we tend to find for foods that we crave and that may not be uh, really healthy for us. So when we do go shopping, make sure that we uh, have maybe already eaten so we do avoid getting like candy or like cakes or anything like that. Um, when we're purchasing uh, starches or grains, we want to consider maybe purchasing the healthy alternatives. So instead of maybe buying a loaf of white bread, we buy a, um, a loaf of multi-grain bread. Or if we're going to consider buying pasta, maybe consider buying whole wheat pasta instead. Um, we do this because um, the whole grain version of those particular carbs and starches, they do, when you eat them, they don't increase your blood sugar as much, uh, which we call a uh, blood sugar uh, glucose index. Um, shop on the outside rather than the inside. So if we consider the setup of a grocery store, a lot of the whole foods, a lot of the non-processed and a lot of the vegetable products and produce, they're on the outside or the perimeter of the grocery store. And if you look at the inside, that's kind of where all the processed foods, all the foods high in sugar and sodium are. So when we do consider where we should be shopping in the grocery store, consider maybe looking on the outside rather than the inside. You want to make sure that you want to be wary of foods that claim that they are lower in fat or reduced sugar. Even though that they do say reduced sugar or lower in fat, they may still have a content that may be uh, outside of our nutritional threshold. So make sure that when you do look at those kinds of foods, it's important that we're always reading the nutrition label. And on uh, top of nutrition labeling, we'll kind of talk about how to read nutrition labels. I'm sure all of us have seen this on a package of, of food, like bread, or maybe like a canned good. So the first thing that we want to look at is we want to check the serving size. So on this particular nutrition label, you can see that the serving size is about two-thirds of a cup or 55 grams. Now that's basically all the nutrition here we're looking at on this label. That's essentially what's in that two-thirds cup or 55 grams. The next thing that we want to look at is the amount of servings per the container. So this whole thing, how many servings are there? And then in this particular example, there's about eight servings per container. It's noted that what you're looking at right now on that nutrition label, it's not for the whole thing. So the amount of calories, the amount of fats and sugar in it, it's actually eight times that much for the whole container. So that's why it's important to look at the serving size and also the number of servings per container. Um, you also want to take a look at the total carbohydrate intake. It's also important to note that even though that total carbs and total sugars are different, that we still keep an eye on the amount of total carbohydrates because it does contribute to our calorie count overall. Uh, the fourth thing that we should look at is checking for foods with more fiber, vitamin, uh, vitamins, and minerals. So making sure that the foods that we eat are high in those particular things as well. And lastly, you want to make sure that we choose foods that are lower calorie, that have lower saturated fat, lower sodium, and um, less added sugar. So if we look at this particular nutrition label, we can see that there's only one gram of saturated fat, zero grams of trans fats, and then here we can see that they added an extra 10 grams of sugar on top of the 12 grams of sugar that's already present in per serving of the container.
So now that we kind of talked about preparing meals at home, I know that there's going to be occasions where we're going to eat out with friends or family for like maybe a birthday or maybe a special occasion. And even though that we do have diabetes, it shouldn't really stop us from being able to go out and having fun. And really the big tip that we want to mention when you're eating out at different restaurants is making sure that we plan, 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 that we plan ahead. And really the best way to do this is um, with the advancement of technology, a lot of restaurants, they actually have their menus posted online. And even some of them, they can even show you the nutritional value of them as well. They'll, they can break down the amount of carbs, sodium, and carbohydrates in their particular meals. And it's good to be able to plan ahead because we'll be able to um, anticipate what meals we should be eating and meals that we would like to eat and maybe even alternatives that we can put in place to making sure that we stay within our uh, nutritional threshold. Uh, letting your waiter know of your dietary needs. So there's going to be times when maybe the restaurant doesn't have their menu, but if you do mention to your waiter that you do have certain uh, dietary restrictions, they'll be more than happy than providing alternatives for you during your meal. And a big thing is that we have to remember when we go out to restaurants that the portion sizes are huge and they're about three to four times as much food that we would actually eat. So because of that, um, a big tip that we'd like to mention is that when you order your food, make sure that you at least split half of the portion of food and put it in, the, in a to-go container so that we wouldn't be at risk for overeating and then going over our nutritional threshold. So some tips uh, when we eat out. Um, so ordering our main dress, uh, dish or entree. So choosing a grilled, steamed, or rotisserie style meat rather than a fried option. So kind of what we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, fried foods, they are high in saturated fat. And they and also, if it's a fried food, there may be breading on it, which can also have a lot of carbohydrates as well. Um, leaving off butter, gravy, or sauces. And if for whatever reason you can't leave them off, at least try to limit them. So things like butter, gravy, and sauces, they're high in sodium and high in fat as well. And certain sauces, they may, have, they may put sugar in it as well. Um, considering our side dishes, I really like french fries, but when you want to consider a healthier option and you still want like that potato-y kind of thing in your meal, making sure that we maybe order a baked potato rather than french fries. Um, if we have like a side salad with our meal, uh, making sure that when we do salad dressing, we have a low-calorie, low-fat option. And if we have some sort of cheese with our meal, like maybe a pizza, um, having low-fat cheese or a low-fat salad cream. And this one's a little bit of low-hanging fruit, but when ordering a uh, beverage, making sure that we avoid um, regular sodas or other sweet drinks, such as fruit juices or sweet tea. Um, better options to consider for beverages. Water is always a big one. Unsweetened teas or diet soda if you want to uh, drink soda for that particular meal. So in summary, uh, being mindful about our nutrition while having diabetes is a key part in managing our symptoms. Um, choosing healthy alternatives, they are small, simple steps with big uh, benefits. Um, making sure that we look at the nutrition labels, that they can tell us a lot what's in our food and what we're putting inside our bodies. And lastly, um, don't shy away from eating out with our friends and family, just making sure that we do plan ahead of time and that we are mindful with our nutrition. Um, that's all I have for tonight, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Alex, for that presentation. If you have any questions from today's presentation or have any topics you would like us to discuss in future videos, please email us at diabetessupportgroup at srhc.com. We would like to thank the SRHC Foundation, they provide financial support for these meetings and they really help make all of this possible. And lastly, our next video will be posted in May. Look for our advertisements on Facebook and the SRHC websites. And again, if you would like to receive notifications or you'd like us to email you the video, uh, please reach us at diabetes support group at srhc.com. Thank you.